Section 1 of A Little Tour in France. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas Clifford, Middlebury, Vermont, USA. A Little Tour in France by Henry James. Section 1. We good Americans, I say it without presumption, are too apt to think that France is Paris, just as we are accused of being too apt to think that Paris is the celestial city. This is by no means the case, fortunately for those persons who take an interest in modern Gaul, and yet are still left vaguely unsatisfied by that epitome of civilization which stretches from the Arc de Triomphe to the Gymnase Theatre. It had already been intimated to the author of these light pages that there are many good things in the Doux Pays de France, of which you get no hint in a walk between those ornaments of the capital. But the truth had been revealed only in quick flashing glimpses, and he was conscious of a desire to look it well in the face. To this end he started, one rainy morning in mid-September, for the charming little city of Tours, from which point it seemed possible to make a variety of fruitful excursions. His excursions resolved themselves ultimately into a journey through several provinces, a journey which had its dull moments, as one may defy any journey not to have, but which enabled him to feel that his proposition was demonstrated, France may be Paris, but Paris is not France. That was perfectly evident on the return to the capital. I must not speak, however, as if I had discovered the provinces. They were discovered, or at least revealed by Balzac, if by any one, and are now easily accessible to visitors. It is true I met no visitors, or only one or two, whom it was pleasant to meet. Throughout my little tour I was almost the only tourist. That is perhaps one reason why it was so successful. Chapter 1 I am ashamed to begin with saying that Touraine is the garden of France. That remark has long ago lost its bloom. The town of Tours, however, has something sweet and bright which suggests that it is surrounded by a land of fruits. It is a very agreeable little city. Few towns of its size are more ripe, more complete, or, I should suppose, in better humour with themselves and less disposed to envy the responsibilities of bigger places. It is truly the capital of its smiling province, a region of easy abundance, of good living, of genial, comfortable, optimistic, rather indolent opinions. Balzac says in one of his tales that the real Tourangeau will not make an effort or displace himself even to go in search of a pleasure, and it is not difficult to understand the sources of this amiable cynicism. He must have a vague conviction that he can only lose by almost any change. Fortune has been kind to him. He lives in a temperate, reasonable, sociable climate, on the banks of a river which, it is true, sometimes floods the country around it, but of which the ravages appear to be so easily repaired that its aggressions may perhaps be regarded, in a region where so many good things are certain, merely as an occasion for healthy suspense. He is surrounded by fine old traditions, religious, social, architectural, culinary, and he may have the satisfaction of feeling that he is French to the core. No part of his admirable country is more characteristically national. Normandy is Normandy, Burgundy is Burgundy, Provence is Provence, but Touraine is essentially France. It is the land of Rabelais, of Descartes, of Balzac, of good books and good company, as well as good dinners and good houses. Georges Sand has somewhere a charming passage about the mildness, the convenient quality, of the physical conditions of central France. Son climat souple et chaud, ses pluies abondantes et courtes. In the autumn of 1882 the rains perhaps were less short than abundant, but when the days were fine it was impossible that anything in the way of weather could be more charming. The vineyards and orchards looked rich in the fresh, gay light. Cultivation was everywhere, but everywhere it seemed to be easy. There was no visible poverty. Thrift and success presented themselves as matters of good taste. The white caps of the women glittered in the sunshine, and their well-made sabots clicked cheerfully on the hard, clean roads. 
Touraine is a land of old chateaus, a gallery of architectural specimens and of large hereditary properties. The peasantry have less of the luxury of ownership than in most other parts of France, though they have enough of it to give them quite their share of that shrewdly conservative look which, in the little, chaffering place of the market-town, the stranger observes so often in the wrinkled brown masks that surmount the agricultural blouse. This is, moreover, the heart of the old French monarchy, and as that monarchy was splendid and picturesque, a reflection of the splendour still glitters in the current of the Loire. Some of the most striking events of French history have occurred on the banks of that river, and the soil it waters bloomed for a while with the flowering of the Renaissance. The Loire gives great style to a landscape of which the features are not, as the phrase is, prominent, and carries the eye to distances even more poetic than the green horizons of Touraine. It is a very fitful stream, and is sometimes observed to run thin and expose all the crudities of its channel, a great defect certainly in a river which is so much depended upon to give an air to the place it waters. But I speak of it as I saw it last, full, tranquil, powerful, bending in large slow curves and sending back half the light of the sky. Nothing can be finer than the view of its course which you get from the battlements and terraces of Amboise. As I looked down on it from that elevation one lovely Sunday morning, through a mild glitter of autumn sunshine, it seemed the very model of a generous, beneficent stream. The most charming part of Tours is naturally the shaded quay that overlooks it, and looks across, too, at the friendly faubourg of saint saint forien and at the terraced heights which rise above this. Indeed, throughout Touraine, it is half the charm of the Loire that you can travel beside it. The great dike which protects it, or protects the country from it, from Blois to Angers, is an admirable road, and on the other side as well the highway constantly keeps it company. A wide river, as you follow a wide road, is excellent company. It heightens and shortens the way. The inns at Tours are in another quarter, and one of them, which is midway between the town and the station, is very good. It is worth mentioning for the fact that everyone belonging to it is extraordinarily polite, so unnaturally polite as at first to excite your suspicion that the hotel has some hidden vice, so that the waiters and chambermaids are trying to pacify you in advance. There was one waiter in especial who was the most accomplished social being I have ever encountered, from morning till night he kept up an inarticulate murmur of urbanity, like the hum of a spinning top. I may add that I discovered no dark secrets at the Hôtel de l'Univers, for it is not a secret to any traveller today that the obligation to partake of a lukewarm dinner in an overheated room is as imperative as it is detestable. For the rest at Tours there is a certain Rue Royale, which has pretensions to the monumental, it was constructed a hundred years ago, and the houses, all alike, have, on a moderate scale, a pompous eighteenth-century look. It connects the Palais de Justice, the most important secular building in the town, with the long bridge which spans the Loire, the spacious, solid bridge pronounced by Balzac in Le Curé de Tours, one of the finest monuments of French architecture. The Palais de Justice was the seat of the government of Léon Gambetta in the autumn of 1870, after the dictator had been obliged to retire in his balloon from Paris, and before the assembly was constituted at Bordeaux. The Germans occupied Tours during that terrible winter. It is astonishing the number of places the Germans occupied. It is hardly too much to say that wherever one goes in certain parts of France, one encounters two great historic facts. One is revolution, the other is the German invasion. The traces of the revolution remain in a hundred scars and bruises and mutilations, but the visible marks of the war of 1870 have passed away. The country is so rich, so living, that she has been able to dress her wounds, to hold up her head, to smile again, so that the shadow of that darkness has ceased to rest upon her. But what you do not see you may still hear, 
and one remembers with a certain shudder that only a few short years ago this province, so intimately French, was under the heel of a foreign foe. To be intimately French was apparently not a safeguard. For so successful an invader it could only be a challenge. Peace and plenty, however, have succeeded that episode, and among the gardens and vineyards of Touraine it seems only a legend the more in a country of legends. It was not all the same for the sake of this checkered story that I mentioned the Palais de Justice and the Rue Royale. The most interesting fact to my mind about the high street of Tours was that as you walked along the bridge on the right-hand trottoir, you can look up at the house on the other side of the way in which Honoré de Balzac first saw the light. That violent and complicated genius was a child of the good-humoured and succulent Touraine. There is something anomalous in the fact, though. If one thinks about it a little, one may discover certain correspondences between his character and that of his native province. Strenuous, laborious, constantly infelicitous in spite of his great successes, he suggests at times a very different set of influences. But he had his jovial, full-feeding side, the side that comes out in the Contes Drolatiques, which are the romantic and epicurean chronicle of the old manors and abbeys of this region. And he was, moreover, the product of a soil into which a great deal of history had been trodden. Balzac was genuinely as well as effectively monarchical, and he was saturated with a sense of the past. Number 39, Rue Royale, of which the basement, like all the basements in the Rue Royale, is occupied by a shop, is not shown to the public and I know not whether tradition designates the chamber in which the author of Le Lys dans la Vallée opened his eyes into a world in which he was to see and to imagine such extraordinary things. If this were the case, I would willingly have crossed his threshold, not for the sake of any relic of the great novelist which it may possibly contain, nor even for that of any mystic virtue which may be supposed to reside within its walls, but simply because to look at those four modest walls can hardly fail to give one a strong impression of the force of human endeavour. Balzac, in the maturity of his vision, took in more of human life than any one since Shakespeare who has attempted to tell his stories about it, and the very small scene on which his consciousness dawned is one end of the immense scale that he traversed. I confess it shocked me a little to find that he was born in a house in a row, a house, moreover, which at the date of his birth must have been only about twenty years old. All that is contradictory. If the tenement selected for this honour could not be ancient and embrowned, it should at least have been detached. There is a charming description in his little tale of La Grenadière, of the view of the opposite side of the Loire, as you have it from the square at the end of the Rue Royale, a square that has some pretensions to grandeur, overlooked as it is by the Hôtel de Ville and the Musée, a pair of edifices which directly contemplate the river, and ornamented with marble images of François Rabelais and René Descartes. The former, erected a few years since, is a very honourable production, the pedestal of the latter could, as a matter of course, only be inscribed with the cogito ergo sum. The two statues mark the two opposite poles to which the brilliant French mind has travelled, and if there were an effigy of Balzac at Tours, it ought to stand midway between them. Not that he, by any means, always struck the happy mean between the sensible and the metaphysical, but one may say of him that half of his genius looks in one direction and half in the other. The side that turns toward François Rabelais would be, on the whole, the side that takes the sun. But there is no statue of Balzac at Tours. There is only, in one of the chambers of the melancholy museum, a rather clever, coarse bust. The description in La Grenadière, of which I just spoke, is too long to quote, neither have I space for any one of the brilliant attempts at landscape painting which are woven into the shimmering texture of Le Lys dans la Vallée. The little manor of Clochegourde, the residence of Madame de Morsauf, the heroine of that extraordinary work, was within a moderate walk of Tours, and the picture in the novel is presumably a copy from an original which it would be possible today to discover. 
I did not, however, even make the attempt. There are so many chateaux in Touraine commemorated in history that it would take one too far to look up those which have been commemorated in fiction. The most I did was to endeavour to identify the former residence of Mademoiselle Gamard, the sinister old maid of Le Curé de Tours. This terrible woman occupied a small house in the rear of the cathedral, where I spent a whole morning in wondering rather stupidly which house it could be. To reach the cathedral from the little place where we stopped just now to look across at the Grenadiers, without, it must be confessed, very vividly seeing it, you follow the quay to the right and pass out of sight of the charming Coteau, which from beyond the river faces the town, a soft agglomeration of gardens, vineyards, scattered villas, gables, and turrets of slate-roofed chateaus, terraces with grey balustrades, moss-grown walls draped in scarlet Virginia creeper. You turn into the town again beside a great military barrack which is ornamented with a rugged medieval tower, a relic of the ancient fortifications known to the Tourangeau of today as the Tour de Guise. The young prince of Joinville, son of that Duke of Guise who was murdered by the order of Henry the Second at Blois, was, after the death of his father, confined here for more than two years, but made his escape one summer evening in 1591 under the nose of his keepers with a gallant audacity which has attached the memory of the exploit to his sullen-looking prison. Tours has a garrison of five regiments, and the little red-legged soldiers light up the town. You see them stroll upon the clean, uncommercial quay, where there are no signs of navigation, not even by oar, no barrels nor bales, no loading nor unloading, no masts against the sky, nor booming of steam in the air. The most active business that goes on there is that patient and fruitless angling in which the French, as the votaries of art for art, excel all other people. The little soldiers, weighed down by the contents of their enormous pockets, pass with respect from one of these masters of the rod to the other, as he sits soaking an indefinite bait in the large, indifferent stream. After you turn your back to the quay, you have only to go a little way before you reach the cathedral. Chapter 2 It is a very beautiful church of the second order of importance, with a charming mouse-coloured complexion and a pair of fantastic towers. There is a commodious little square in front of it, from which you may look up at its very ornamental face but for purposes of frank admiration, the sides and the rear are perhaps not sufficiently detached. The Cathedral of Tours, which is dedicated to St. Gatianus, took a long time to build. Begun in 1170, it was finished only in the first half of the 16th century, but the ages and the weather have interfused so well the tone of the different parts, that it presents, at first at least, no striking incongruities, and looks even exceptionally harmonious and complete. There are many grander cathedrals, but there are probably few more pleasing, and this effect of delicacy and grace is at its best toward the close of a quiet afternoon, when the densely decorated towers, rising above the little Place de l'Archeveche, lift their curious lanterns into the slanting light and offer a multitudinous perch to troops of circling pigeons. The whole front at such time has an appearance of great richness, although the niches which surround the three high doors, with recesses deep enough for several circles of sculpture, and indent the four great buttresses that ascend beside the huge rose window, carry no figures beneath their little chiselled canopies. The blast of the great revolution blew down most of the statues in France, and the wind has never set very strongly toward putting them up again. The embossed and crocketed cupolas, which crown the towers of saint gatien are not very pure in taste, but like a good many impurities they have a certain character. The interior has a stately slimness with which no fault is to be found, and which in the choir, rich in early glass, and surrounded by a broad passage, becomes very bold and noble. Its principal treasure, perhaps, is the charming little tomb of the two children who died young, of Charles the Eighth and Anne of Brittany, in white marble, embossed with symbolic dolphins and exquisite arabesques. 
The little boy and girl lie side by side on a slab of black marble, and a pair of small kneeling angels, both at their head and at their feet, watch over them. Nothing could be more perfect than this monument, which is the work of Michel Colomb, one of the earlier glories of the French Renaissance. It is really a lesson in good taste. Originally placed in the great abbey church of Saint-Martin, which was for so many years the holy place of Tours, it happily survived the devastation to which that edifice, already sadly shattered by the wars of religion and successive profanations, finally succumbed in 1797. In 1815, the tomb found an asylum in a quiet corner of the cathedral. I ought, perhaps, to be ashamed to acknowledge that I found the profane name of Balzac capable of adding an interest even to this venerable sanctuary. Those who have read the terrible little story of Le Curé de Tours will perhaps remember that, as I have already mentioned, the simple and childlike old Abbé Birotteau, victim of the infernal machinations of the Abbé Troubert and Mademoiselle Gamard, had his quarters in the house of that lady. She had a specialty of letting lodgings to priests, which stood on the north side of the cathedral, so close under its walls that the supporting pillar of one of the great flying buttresses was planted in the spinster's garden. If you wander around behind the church, in search of this more than historic habitation, you will have occasion to see that the side and rear of saint Gatien makes a delectable and curious figure. A narrow lane passes beside the high wall which conceals from sight the palace of the archbishop, and beneath the flying buttresses, the far-projecting gargoyles, and the fine south porch of the church. It terminates in a little, dead, grass-grown square, entitled the Place Grégoire de Tours. All this part of the exterior of the cathedral is very brown, ancient, gothic, grotesque. Balzac calls the whole place a desert of stone. A battered and gabled wing, or outhouse, as it appears to be, of the hidden palace, with a queer old stone pulpit jutting out from it, looks down on this melancholy spot, on the other side of which is a seminary for young priests, one of whom issues from a door in a quiet corner, and holding it open a moment behind him, shows a glimpse of a sunny garden, where you may fancy other black young figures strolling up and down. Mademoiselle Gamard's house, where she took her two abbés to board, and basely conspired with one against the other, is still further round the cathedral. You cannot quite put your hand upon it to-day, for the dwelling which you say to yourself that it must have been Mademoiselle Gamard's does not fulfil all the conditions mentioned in Balzac's description. The edifice in question, however, fulfils conditions enough, in particular, its little court offers hospitality to the big buttress of the church. Another buttress, corresponding with this, the two between them sustain the gable of the north transept, is planted in the small cloister, of which the door on the further side of the little soundless rue de la Salette, where nothing ever seems to pass, opens opposite to that of Mademoiselle Gamard. There is a very genial old sacristan, who introduced me to this cloister from the church. It is very small and solitary, and much mutilated, but it nestles with a kind of wasted friendliness beneath the big walls of the cathedral. Its lower arcades have been closed, and it has a small plot of garden in the middle, with fruit trees which I should imagine to be too much overshadowed. In one corner is a remarkably picturesque turret, the cage of a winding staircase which ascends, no great distance, to an upper gallery, where an old priest, the chanoine guardian of the church, was walking to and fro with his breviary. The turret, the gallery, and even the chanoine guardian belonged, that sweet September morning, to the class of objects that are dear to painters in watercolours. End of section one.